episode 35. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we discuss running a great practice so you can quit worrying about paying the bills and focus instead on creating great architecture and leaving a lasting legacy. Today is part two of my interview with architecture recent graduate Hank Butita. For his master's thesis project in architecture school, he converted a bus into a mobile living space. And so today he's going to talk about doing that and about the press that he got during that. Now, during this interview, I recorded an intro at the end of this interview. So there might be a little break about uh, about 10 minutes into the interview. You might hear the interview jump around a little bit because I kind of had to splice something in. But anyway, sit back, hold tight, and I hope you enjoy this interview. I love the passion that Hank has when he talks about architecture and his dreams of the future. It's something that we can all be inspired by, whether we're recent graduates or whether we've been practicing architecture for a long time. So here's the show. Hey, Agile Architects, welcome back to the business of architecture. Today, we have a fresh face on the show. I'd like to welcome Hank Butita. He is a recent graduate of the University of Minnesota master's degree program. And he recently, for his master's degree thesis, converted an old school bus into his architectural project. He took it on a 5,000-mile trip around the U.S., which he live blogged the whole time. And that's how I found him online, because he had a, a very high profile on online with the social media sites, etc. So anyways, Hank, welcome to the show, and we want to hear more about the bus experience. Yeah. Hi. Um, the bus was a fantastic experience. Uh, I was really lucky that I had the chance to, uh, for my thesis, kind of do double duty, um, building myself a project and also get credit for it. Um, and then, um, how should I say this? Uh, at the end of the, at the end of the, semester when the professors tell you this is a great project you should continue with it um, I took them seriously and was able to take it on a 5,000 mile road trip um, to not only test out the space but kind of blog about it as a portfolio project and in the process hopefully expand the discussion of um, the tiny house movement living small get people to kind of reconsider what they consider a uh, viable living situation Interesting. So what is a viable living situation? What did you learn about living on that bus and about the kind of spaces we live in? Um, I, I mean, I realized how quickly you can adapt to almost any living situation. Uh, for the first few days on the bus, we were a little frustrated that we hadn't yet figured out how the portable toilet worked, that we didn't have a shower, um, and that there was no privacy between our two beds. Um, but as the trip went on, we learned kind of what it was going to take to live that lifestyle. And we became, you know, less frustrated with uh, the lack of privacy. It was just a part of everyday life. And um, we learned to stop at rest stations, you know, to use the bathroom. And that anytime we found a friendly uh, stranger who was going to take, a friendly local who was going to take us in or stop with a friend to, like, use an opportunity to take a shower and uh, do laundry. Um, so it, in the long term, there were a number of upgrades that the bus would have needed. But uh, we were surprised how functional it was to live in such a small space with multiple people. Awesome. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about self promotion because you know here on yep. the on the show we like to be just very transparent and very, you know, we like to do away with the fluff. Yeah. You know, obviously this is an awesome opportunity for you to promote what you do in your future and and who you are and get your name out there. Yeah. You know, what did you learn about promoting yourself from this experience? Uh, I learned to keep track of everything. Um, make sure to keep a contact list of all the press you talk to. Um, and, and be ready to kind of capture the people who are coming your way. Set up a, a Facebook account, a Twitter account, any way that people can follow you and you can reach them again, an email list, anything, because um, as much fun as it, as it is and as much as it seems like it, it's going to last forever, um, you want to be able to reach these people the next time you have a project that, uh, that needs attention or you want to spread the word about. So make sure to take advantage of the opportunity and, and kind of hold on to the people who want to be your, fan, who want to be your fans. So cool. Yeah. And so so you're not going the traditional architecture route, which would be to get a job at a firm and get that constant paycheck because yeah. you feel like you have, I mean, it sounds like you have a bit of idealism. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, 
I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can be in this position. I know I'm never going to be homeless. Uh, I have a supportive family and a bus. <laughs> and um, I, can kind of, I can kind of make a go at this. They understand that I'm working towards something, and they see that it's kind of on the horizon, especially with um, the attention the bus has gotten. They're giving me a bit of leeway to kind of sort things out. I, you know, I, I was even conferenced with them yesterday like I said, hey, I found this 6,000-square-foot warehouse space that I think is with, actually within budget. If I split it with a few people, what do they think? They said, well, you know, if you think you can do it, move on it, and we'll figure out how to make it work. So um, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm having the chance to give it a shot. And I think, I mean, the only way it's going to happen is if I actually do it. I can't have an idea about I want a furniture business and draw some pieces of furniture and have it become a reality. I have to get out there, and I have to make a few pieces, and I have to take it to trade shows. You know, so um, I think our goal is to to capitalize on a couple of these projects that have already come our way and to get them built completed. Um, so one of the things one of the things that I think people love about the bus is that it was a student that did it. Right. You know, um, if it was just any old guy who converted, it wouldn't have quite the same appeal. And there's, there's something that people love about a student actually making a thing because he, the whole system right now people kind of think is broken. And, you know, college doesn't do you any good. Students aren't learning anything. So we want to capitalize on really finishing a few real-world projects while we're – some of these guys are still in school. I'm fresh out of school. Maybe get a little bit of attention just for making that leap so soon and keep a momentum going. Like that, that's the best plan we've got so far. Awesome. Well, the theme of our show is yeah. – to do it anyway. Yeah. So you're <laughs> just an excellent example of getting out there executing that, you know, don't don't let uh, don't let our, your fears hold you back. Right. You know, to get out there and and dive off the board. It looks like you've set the trend by doing that. Now, I just want to circle back. You mentioned that you're yeah. going to be doing a cabin out in in California. How yeah. how did the client find you? Um I'm you know, I'm not sure if it was through a blog or 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 through a news site, um but he <laughs> How, how do I say this? Was it because the media exposure you had gotten from? It definitely was. It definitely was from the media exposure. I haven't done a very good job of protect, protecting my identity at all. I haven't blocked anything. I have let hundreds of people friend me on Facebook. I have left my email hanging out there in the wind on on a front page of our blog because right now I'm more interest. I'm less scared of the the risk involved of sharing that information than I'm that I am interested in having people contact me. So I have, I have new a- news agencies emailing directly to my, my inbox and, and client, potential clients emailing me directly. Some projects are just a bit too far out there that, you know, they're not serious, they don't have a budget, or they don't know what they want even. But this, this client was serious, and, um, you know, he, he asked me up front, like, would you be interested in looking at some small residential architecture? And... You know, that's, that's kind of the dream for a lot of architects to have, have a client who has a small, intimate project um, and a sufficient budget and, and like, is, is interested in you. You know, um, I felt so lucky. Not that I'll ever have – I don't have the upper hand in this situation in, in any way, but there is something that comes with uh, a client approaching you as opposed to you approaching them. You know that they are already interested in your work, and you can have confidence that there is something about – um, something about you that they're interested in working with. So it gives me a bit more confidence than if I had just approached someone and said, hey, could, I know you have this project. Could I take a look at it? So um, uh, it's, he, he, he found us through the popularity of the site. And I think um, from, what, from the discussions I've had with him, he had actually already been working with an architect, um, but that the process was kind of, he said he wasn't having fun, to be honest. You know, it was, they kept negotiating him towards higher price ranges that he wasn't really comfortable with. And, um, you know, he was getting b- bills. He doesn't understand what was being produced and the design they weren't in love with. And, you know, they just kind of felt like they were being pressured by the architect. And I'm like, I think we can fix all of those things. Like, we can, this is, we're not going to function like a traditional firm, you know, um, our agreement involves a, for the preliminary design phase, it involves a retainer. So there's no, we're not billing you. There's like a set amount that you're going to compensate us for. And we're going to have this conversation back and forth. We opened like a Google Docs, a shared folder 
where we just dump information into and say, hey, I like this picture. What do you think? Or, you know, we were kind of leaning this direction. Could you, could you incorporate some of that? And so communication is really open and um, it's, it's kind of, it feels like a low risk situation. We're not worried about, uh, you know, how much is this going to cost us or, you know, what are we going to get out of it? We've already clearly established this is what we're going to provide you. And it's, it's a dream project. If, if this could lead to more, I, I would let this become a career even if I didn't intend for it to be initially, you know? Awesome. So in addition to practicing, you have some teaching on the horizon? Hopefully, yes. Um, I, um, I'm connected with, uh, I'm, on, um, I'm on the good list, I guess, for a couple of instructors at the school who run our Bachelor of Design Arts, Bachelor of Design Architecture uh, And that program. school is, I don't think we ever mentioned the name of the school. Oh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, so our, our uh, architecture, undergraduate architecture program is kind of split into two divisions that um, students are kind of able to choose which path they want to take their junior year. And um, one route is the traditional Bachelor of Science where you, um, you, know, you, you do a lot of drawings of buildings, plans, sections, you take structures courses. And it's kind of the fast track to the graduate program. Um, the BDA is, is, takes a look at design more broadly. They say, if, if you're interested in being the Eameses, take the BDA program. You're going to be working a little more hands-on, a little more experimental, less at the building scale. Um, but I'm, I'm fascinated with the program. It wasn't really available when I went through the school. I'm fascinated with it because of how hands-on it is and how it teaches students to work um, with materials and, and understand how things come together. But also because the BDA seems to be um, approaching collaboration in a new way. There are a lot of group projects that have people... Um, capitalizing on diverse skill sets as opposed to uh, kind of the very narrow skill sets that are sometimes encouraged in the, the BS program. Um, and so uh, I've, I've started following up on um, becoming an instructor in this program. And because of the projects I've done in my education and, and the way I've approached this bus project, uh, they're, they seem open to, to this becoming a possibility. And so I'm really looking forward to to getting the chance to kind of get into a classroom and start um, start really incorporating this full scale design, full scale iteration as as essential to the design process, not exclusively. There's still there's still um, great value in, in you know working two dimensionally, um, sketching and making small models. But I think that there we need to also expand it to um, to kind of doing prototyping. I'm understanding how your building is actually coming together. So I'm excited to get into the classroom and kind of shake things up a bit. Very, very interesting. So the BDA program is an undergraduate program. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, there's been some other popular programs that have sort of gone down that path. The Rural Studio is one of the most prominent yes. down at Auburn. And so, and you said this is a new program at University of Minnesota? It's, it's still really getting its bearings. Um, I think it's five years old at this point and mm -hmm. so it's um it's slowly kind of taking root but um they're trying to trying to stabilize it a bit i guess right now it's it's chaos yeah. it's a lot of fun there are a sure. lot of a lot of experimentation going on wow so yeah. as as a new graduate do you do you see how do you think these these new kind of programs do you think this is a movement in architecture where different fields are merging or is just is it just uh, a fluke i mean where do you see the future of architecture going God, there's so much potential with collaboration. Um, I, so I really hope it's a movement towards this, and I hope it starts to branch out um, to collaborating with other fields and other, especially the other design fields, but even beyond that, you know, if we could bring some of the engineers in on these projects, think of, <laughs> think of the, the opportunities to, to, um, to kind of integrate that into design and come up with something that's much stronger. Um, I... I was really frustrated with group work throughout my education um, because it always happened in a class of people with like skill sets. Um, the time that I, my, my epiphany with group projects came, not this past summer, but the summer before, I was invited to help out with a, um, a group of guys I, I, I barely knew who uh, were involved in a Red Bull competition. One of those, you know, crazy Red Bull, um, and it's, uh, it was a kind of a maker competition, what was it called? Red Bull Creation. And basically the goal of it, the, the premise was that um, on Thursday night, they would tell you what the problem was and you had to solve it by Sunday. 
And uh, the problem for us that they told us was uh, make a game. And so over the course of three days, uh, me and this group of, of, of people, including um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, people who worked for um, uh, Adafruit, who makes like our Arduino um, products, Arduino-related products, and like all these kind of diverse backgrounds came together to build a submarine simulator game where you had to run around it would say, you turn this knob, and if you didn't turn the knob quick enough, you got hosed with water, and the whole thing rocked back and forth, and flashing lights, and everyone came to the table with a different skill set. You know, I came, I came with the CNC knowledge, and so I was able to cut out the shell pretty rapidly so other people could start installing stuff, and the electronics guy was like, okay, I'm going to write this software, could you guys wire up? And, like, bringing those diverse skill sets together made for a project that could not have happened otherwise, especially in that time frame. So I love the idea of, of kind of looking at things from a, maybe not a directly architectural perspective, maybe not specifically, this is how you draw a floor plan. Um, not that that is important, but that to also include in your education some, some crazy, some, some other um, backgrounds. One way that the University of Minnesota is really, uh, I think, capitalizing on that idea is um, in the graduate program, every spring is split into two halves. So you have like the first half of the semester and the second half, but the week right before spring break exists between them. It's its own week where you have no other coursework. It's called Catalyst Week. And you have, it's, it's one credit pass fail, and they really just want you to do something crazy. And so they have these strange courses that one year I learned about Arduinos, other people learned about uh, Grasshopper, um, and there was, there was just a lot of strange stuff going on. And for one week, you go nuts. You get up early, you stay up late, and you work yourself to the bone to create this kind of crazy object. And it's really refreshing to just kind of focus on one thing and clear everything out of your mind, learn a new skill, and see how you can apply it. It was fantastic. Wow. So an Arduino is a little, is a little CPU, right? A little computer. It's, uh, that, that you can it's, it's process even simpler than that. It's a microcontroller. So it's not mm -hmm. even a, a computer. It's, uh, it basically, all it does is turn switches on and off when you tell it. But you can write complex code to then turn on this sensor and respond in this fashion. And um, it's, it's an incredibly flexible platform that has a lot of potential, even in architecture, I think. Interesting. And what is Grasshopper? Oh, Grasshopper. Sorry. Uh, using all this jargon. Um, Grasshopper is a, a parametric plugin for Rhino. So Rhino is a pretty popular uh, 3D modeling platform used by designers. And Grasshopper allows you to design in Rhino and create geometry that you can control parametrically, so with, with variables, for example. So the simplest um, example would be you could draw a square, and instead of having it be a, a kind of a static square, you could hook it up to a couple of sliders, and then as you slide it up and down, the X dimension will increase or decrease, or the Y dimension will increase, decrease, and you can really build some pretty complex uh, um, soft, not software, some pretty complex um, uh, what do they call them? I've forgotten the word. But basically programs to to make responsive geometry. Um, and people use it, I think, too often to create blob of texture, you know, kind of create swoopy, curvy forms that may or may not be functional. But there are so many practi practical applications possible for this. I'd like to uh, integrate it into the coursework I'm teaching, in fact. Um, for example, let me give an example of how it could be really practical. For the bus, all of the furniture in it was uh, designed in, in a 3D modeling in, in Rhino. And then I used those files to cut them on a CNC machine. Well, not every bus is the same dimension. Maybe my window bays are 28 inches and another bus has window bays of 30 inches. If I have all of these parts programmed into the software to be connected parametrically, I could potentially have it hooked up to a single slider that says, what is the width of your window bay? 30 inches update all of my parts immediately so I can cut out in a moment's notice all of these all of these furniture parts to fit a new space. And it's it could save so much work if, if you're willing to invest the time up front in developing um, you know a program that you're you're interested in using repeatedly and then adapting it to unique situations. So it's kind of it's it's rapid um, customization. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, my head's spinning. There's just so much <laughs> untapped potential there for yeah. the future of automation, computers, and architecture, and creating space. I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface, and you're really on the cutting edge. 
I hope so. <laughs> no, it's I, I would I would love to dig into how this can become practical. Because right now it isn't it isn't yet. It's used for a lot of kind of um, uh, iconic pieces, and it isn't really yet being employed in architecture for really too many practical purposes. Enough practical purposes. Sure. No, not enough. You've made something important about what you've done, collaboration. So I just want to follow yeah. up, and this will be maybe the last question, just about architects out there who may be involved in traditional practices, what suggestions do you have for them if they want to try to bring in a little bit of collaboration and try to bring in people with different skill sets? What suggestions do you have for making those connections, meeting those people, and then collaborating with them? Um, this may not be for everyone, but I would say join a makerspace. Um, there are all kinds of crazy people running around these spaces, um, and they're so starting. What is a makerspace? Tell us. <laughs> they're they're starting to pop up in a lot of um, kind of major like metro areas. It's it's basically a. It's often like a wood shop that you 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 pay membership for, but in addition to like woodworking, people are doing are playing with electronics and making making their own little toys and gadgets and and little projects they either want to kickstart or making for a you know a friend or sibling or kids. Um, and you have people from all different backgrounds. You know, you have retired electrical engineers putzing around. You have uh, guys who are working at the building across the street and just thought it'd be cool to check out, and now they come over after work every day. Um, you know, one of the maker spaces that I belonged to for a while, um, a guy got into making trebuchets. And so you, you show up at this space, and you start working on your project, and other people always take an interest in it. They peek their head over and say, what are you doing? What are you up to? And... Um, you form, you form these friendships with people who you otherwise wouldn't have met, and they have projects that they need help with, and you have a skill set you can bring to the table. Um, if I had not joined um, the makerspace that unfortunately collapsed last year um, in Minneapolis, uh, I would have. there are a number of projects I would not have been able to get involved with that have kind of helped me reach the point I'm at. Um, and so it's... That is that was the easiest way for someone like me who's were interested in working on anything hands on to to kind of meet a new community and and get offered some projects that otherwise might not have happened. Awesome. That's an excellent suggestion. Okay, so here's the last question, Hank. Yeah. And it's this. What suggestions do you have for people who are looking to go into graduate school for architecture, go about finding the right fit in terms of school and in terms of what they want? <sighs> um it's hard to, to, to give any advice outside of, from, from my own perspective. And my perspective was, uh, was a bit frustrating. I had a bit of a struggle. Um, I was really interested in trying a new institution for my graduate program. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and I was really interested in just experiencing a new culture. Um, one struggle I had was that a... Um, one of my professors that I needed a letter of recommendation from wanted to be more selective. He wanted to be very careful about where I was applying. And so part of his way of doing that was telling me I could, he would only send letters to three schools. And I said, that's, that's not enough. You know, <laughs> give, give, give me a little more than that. And he said, okay, five schools. So that allowed me to apply to um, a throwaway, a school I knew I wouldn't get into, uh, three schools that I would like to get into, and my quote-unquote safety, my home school. And um, luck of the draw, bad luck, I, I was turned down from everywhere but my home school. So the two things to be learned from this are apply everywhere. <laughs> apply all the places you're remotely interested in. A $70, $100 application is not that big of a deal when it comes to the next three years of life, your life and the education you get. Also, no matter where you end up, don't let it crush you. <laughs> you know, I, I was really um, demotivated for a little while just because I'd been rejected from so many places and I felt like I was, quote unquote, stuck at my home university. But they still gave me plenty of opportunity to do the projects I wanted to take on. You know, even though the curriculum may have leaned towards um, kind of more traditional architecture and a number of projects, they allowed me to make it my own. They allowed me to step outside the boundaries, break the rules, and, and address the projects I, the way I wanted to address them. And um, I, I don't know if all schools are that uh, open-minded or not, but uh, I have, like, just because you end up at a school maybe you, don't, you didn't think you were going to, that you wanted to be at, like, don't let that 
destroy all the opportunities you're going to have there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Hank, we look forward to finding out what's next. It's been Excellent. awesome talking to you and getting a fresh perspective about architecture, the built environment, and Thank the you business so of architecture. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.